Welcome to WrestleMania! All right, ladies and gentlemen, people of UCLA Bruins and beyond, welcome back to UCLA Radio's Red Carpet to WrestleMania. Today, we have an absolutely amazing guest, two-time WWE World Champion, uh, one of the only third-generation superstars, the, the last survivor of the infamous Hart Family Dungeon. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to UCLA Radio, Natalia Neidhart, Lisa Marie Baron, aka Victoria, aka Tara, former TNA Knockouts Champion, two-time WWE Women's Champion, and the only Bruin to hold a uh, world championship in the industry of professional wrestling. Vice President of uh, Talent and Production at Fox Sports, Mr. Jacob Ullman. We have the influencer, Brian Zanes. You may know him as Jonathan Coachman from ESPN or NBC, but most people, most wrestling fans know him as the coach. Thank you so much for joining us here today, and welcome on board, Coach. How are you doing? Anish, if you're going to have a road to WrestleMania, then it only seems appropriate that you bring the coach on to uh, kind of help you down uh, the road and that journey. So I'm excited to be here. I love UCLA. I love what you guys are doing at your incredible uh, radio station there on campus. So uh, let's get to it, man. I got a lot to talk about today. Honored to be on the UCLA freaking interview. I'm so honored, honestly. Go Bruins. So for people who might not know, your connection to UCLA goes further than just yourself and being a fan of the school. It goes to the fact that your father, WWE Hall of Famer, well, one of two members of the Hart Foundation, Jim D'Anville Neidhart, was the Bruin himself. He was a student athlete here, and he had a full scholarship to UCLA for track and field, being one of the best shot putters in the country. So my dad would talk about UCA, UCLA all the time. My dad loved, you know, being part of the school and. You know, my dad, when he was a teenager, he was one of the best, when my dad was a teenager, he was one of the best athletes in the country. So he could go go to any university anywhere he wanted. First of all, you studied at UCLA and what made you decide to apply here? Uh, that was my, my dream school um, growing up. Um, I went to um, I went to Riverside Community College, okay, for my, my first uh, two years. And then I transferred to Loma Linda University, accepted to UCLA and I was like, yay. Got an apartment right behind Fraternity Row. And so um, I met China at um, West Hollywood. Um, I was working at Crunch Gym um, as a trainer. Right. And, um, and I lived there with my ex-husband at the time. And um, met her and I said, oh, I have a couple friends that do wrestling. And she goes, wow, are you a wrestler? You have a good look for it. Um, and I go, oh, I think I can do what the guys do though. Like Ray Mysterio and Rob Van Dam, gymnastics, mm -hmm. the flyer, you know, like, no fear, you know, that kind of thing. When did you first realize you were a wrestling fan? When did you realize, you know, you like this and this is going to be a big part of your life? I first started watching it kind of by accident at my grandparents' house in the late 80s. They would just be on. Not like, my grandpa wasn't like a huge wrestling fan, but he loved sports. Mm -hmm. So if baseball yeah. or hockey wasn't on, we'd watch Saturday Night's main event. But it was Attitude Era when I realized like this was it for me. Like I was all in on wrestling. And when I get excited about something, I dive all in. I'm 110% in, super Thank passionate you. about whatever it is. So I wanted to ask you, what was the first time you really decided or realized, you know what, I think I want to go into this industry of sports broadcasting? Uh, it was way before high school or college. I knew when I was really a young kid, like seven or eight years old, because uh, I grew up in a, several small towns in Kansas. And there weren't a lot of professional athletes from where I came from. There weren't a lot of uh, guys that really went anywhere. And so my dad told me early on, I said, uh, you know, I want to be a pro athlete. I want to be a pro basketball player because I played all the sports and I played college basketball as well. But uh, my dad was like, listen, there's a very, very small uh, number of people that play professional sports. So what else would you like to do? And I said, well, you know, I, I, I've always been a talker. And I said, well, maybe I could talk about it for a living because the only thing I've truly loved in my life, other than my family and a couple of dogs, is is sports. Uh, and then and then I've always been a wrestling fan too. So uh, this is something I've always wanted to do. I've never had a plan B. Uh, I've been lucky enough to have uh, a couple of really cool jobs in my career, and I, I I'm, I'm excited about the next 25 years too. But um, I've known for a really really long time. What was the match or the storyline or the superstar that made you a wrestling fan and kept you a wrestling fan? Uh, you know, I think the wrestler that really caught my attention the most was the Black Ninja in WCW <laughs> versus NWO World Tour on the N64. It was a video game that actually got me yeah. into professional wrestling. And uh, it was something where I, growing up, I I try, I try would flip the channels as a kid and, and find wrestling, not really knowing who anyone was. 
and my parents would always like they, they would instinctively know it and there's like burst of, no don't watch the wrestling <laughs> it's bad stuff don't watch it uh, and so i would have to you know tune, tune out of it and so i had this negative uh, connotation with wrestling for a long time growing up until like 1998 when it just blew up and everyone was watching it and then like my friend like he rented the game and like neither of us were wrestling fans but we played the that game for the entire weekend and so he never really followed the wrestling after that but i was hooked and so i started watching the real stuff on tv you know like after that i don't want it to get in, i don't want to get into too nitty gritty of what you do at fox but suffice to say you're extremely high up you were integral in bringing uh smackdown to fox so i just want to ask what was it about smackdown and just having wwe on fox that made it so important to you to close that deal yeah, I just thought that Fox Sports and the WWE were kind of the right fit. Um, it, it uh, you know, we're known for our uh, Fox Sports attitude and, and uh, we're a little uh, edgier. And it's funny when we, you know, we got started broadcasting the NFL in 1994, we were, you know, oh, oh my God, where do these people come from? They're taking the NFL from, the CB, from CBS, who's been the establishment for so long. And now, bizarrely, we're, we're you know we've been around forever. But it, it, I think we just have a, a different feel than the other broadcast networks and the other sports departments. And it just felt like the right fit to me. And um, uh, you know the, the way it worked with SmackDown is um, you know we put that on Friday, moved it to Friday nights, and kind of sandwich it in uh, a big um, four four day block of sports on Fox where Thursday, uh, we have Thursday night football with the NFL, Friday, we have Friday night SmackDown, Saturday college football, and Sunday NFL. So it, it, it really kept kind of Thursday promoted Friday, Friday promoted Saturday, Saturday promoted Sunday, and kind of keeps it all together. So it, it, I think it really um, augmented what we were doing. So it, it was a great fit, and, and we were able to have the WWE move it to Friday night, which really fit well into what we do. And what's so crazy to think is that Jim Gamble died for such a great athlete, but at the same time, he was one of the most captivating characters in WWE history, not either tag team or singles. I mean, he had an almost Shakespearean vibe about him whenever he would, you know, cut his promos alongside Brett back, um, you know, up in front of the in front of the green screen. So I just wanted to ask, how do you go from being such, well, such a dedicated athlete and then developing that personality or was it just always in I think my dad always just had a ton of personality. And I think that's one of the cool things about athletes transitioning into WWE careers. You look at somebody like Kurt Angle, who is a, you know, an Olympian um, and very much an elite athlete like my dad. Um, and you see that personality in them come out. And, you know, in WWE, you have people that have that personality that it, it can't really be taught. It has to, I think it's something that lives with inside them that they were born with, that they have that it factor, that sparkle, that, you know, not everybody is meant to have a personality like The Rock. <laughs> not very many people do. Um, but I think that's what's cool about WWE is that we, as a company, find a way to bring out these unique qualities and people that really allow their personalities to shine through. And it's from as long as I can remember from even old videos and stuff of my dad, he was always kind of a ham. You know, he was always just like, he just always was the center of attention. He was like, the, you know, the person that lit up a room. And so he just had that personality to him that I think when he teamed up with Bret Hart, he was he, he was really able to help Brett come out of his shell because I think Brett has a different kind of personality than my dad. Much like, mm -hmm. um, you know, my dad was more outgoing and Brett was very was a very serious technical wrestler. Um, but my dad was able to bring out bring out so much personality in Brett, and that's why they complemented each other so much as the Hart Foundation. So, it's personality is important. <laughs> Natalia character has gone through so many iterations from being the, the manager for, for the New Heart Foundation, the husband, and uh, David Hart Smith, to being a multiple time world champion, the Divas of Doom. So I want to ask you, which has been your favorite period in your career? Um, I mean, every stage of my career, I feel like, has been a roller coaster. You know, nothing has been easy. I've never, I've never gone into work where, like, everything was just laid out and super nice and super easy. I think it's because I struggled so much in WWE and, and within finding the right storylines and the right moments and the right matches and the right opponents that I've been able to kind of really carve out a character that's kind of like the Iron Woman of the WWE. And, and like, you look at my body of work and it's, you know, I, I, think, I think for me, I think 
working alongside Ronda Rousey was something that was a highlight in my career because she was somebody that is such an entity in sports from her world, from MMA. She's a pioneer for women in mixed martial arts, but getting a chance to work with her and, you know, we had a match together, um, just one single match because we were normally tag partners, but working with her was something I really enjoyed and working with Beth Phoenix, I, I really, really enjoyed that because again, it's about complimenting each other. It's about bringing out the best in each other. It's about believing in the person that you're working with. And, you know, in order to succeed in WWE, you're not, it's not a solo score. You're playing with other people, you know, and everything has to kind of nicely, naturally come together. So working with Ronda was great. Working with Beth Phoenix was great. Obviously managing Tyson Kidd and, and um, David Hart Smith being a part of the Hart Dynasty, which is, you know, that team may never have ever happened had I, had I not fought for it. And having mm -hmm. been with Beth Phoenix, I may never have been a team with Beth Phoenix had I not fought for it. And, you know, it, even, even, even wanting still to have a match with Ronda Rousey, I feel like it's something I'm going to have to still fight mm -hmm. for to do. But I like that. I think, I think that the second that you become a talent that doesn't care, doesn't, doesn't want to fight, doesn't really care, you know, that's comfortable or complacent or okay with just settling for less than what you're worth. I think that's like, that's what I don't want to see any WWE talent become. Like, and on that, on storytelling, you as a broadcaster, if you had to point to, to people who didn't know you and say, that's the match that signifies what I did as the coach, as a commentator, which match would that be that you call? Boy, you know, I don't think anybody has ever asked me that before. Because honestly, what people remember the most is my last three or four years, I was the character and not a commentator. Mm -hmm. And so they're all, oh, you were the guy that did this or John Cena put you through a table or whatever. So. And I, I guess I don't even look at myself as, uh, you know, one of the the leading broadcasters because I did so many different things. So uh, I guess if, I guess the last WrestleMania that I did, I got to see from ringside in Orlando, it was the, the Ric Flair, his retirement match. And I love Ric and still do so much. And I was hoping that that would be really his retirement match. And we've seen over the last 12 years uh, that in the wrestling business, you never retire. You just walk away from time to time. Uh, but to see that up close, to see Shawn Michaels say, I'm sorry. To also see Floyd Mayweather, who did an I Quit match with, I think it was I Quit, with the Big Show. And to see how seriously Floyd Mayweather took it. And to see that behind closed doors, he's so different than what people see the persona of him uh, on social media or in real life. Um, I enjoyed that. So probably probably that WrestleMania in 2008. And I also knew deep in my heart that that would be my last one, or I thought it would be my last one, that I would ever work for the company and, and be at WrestleMania. So that, that one was pretty special. Awesome, yeah, that, that's a great WrestleMania right there. And that Ric Flair retirement match, you know, stole the show that night. So I can definitely see where you're coming from. Um, yeah, let's go on to that. After WWE, you went on to become a really successful broadcaster for ESPN, hosting SportsCenter. And right now you're the voice of golf on NBC Sports. So I want to ask, what took you from WWE to deciding, hey, I want to do mainstream sports or, you know, quote unquote, mainstream sports from now? Well, um, really, truly, I was getting burned out. It was over nine years of traveling every single week. I only missed one Monday night in nine and a half years. And that was after I got married to go on my honeymoon. So when you travel 52 weeks a year and when people hear that, they don't believe me or any of us, but it was truly, and it still is 52 weeks a year. So I was truly burnt out. I also knew that if I didn't get out at that point, I was always going to have what, what I call the wrestling stain on me. That uh, There's so many executives that don't look at the talent that you have to have to do pro wrestling, but instead look at something that they may not like, that they may not watch. And innately, human beings love to be negative about things they don't know or things they don't care to know about. And pro wrestling falls into that category for a lot of network executives. So when I got the chance to go to ESPN and the lady who hired me, I worked with an MSG network the last two years I was at WWE. So I thought I was going to go to MSG. So when she left, I was crushed because I knew I did not want to sign another deal with the WWE. I knew I couldn't do 
three more years of that schedule. Plus, I just got married. I just was having my daughter. So when I had that opportunity, I had to take it. And the timing worked out. WWE could not have been better. They took me off the air, put Mick Foley in my position. I had four months where I didn't have to travel. Uh, I got to be home for my daughter's birth. I got to move and then start at, at ESPN in August of 2008. So uh, it was an easy decision. Plus, that was always my dream. Wrestling was never my dream. ESPN was always my dream. And then over time, th that dream has changed too. Now my dreams are different. But I can always say I made it to ESPN. I made it for 10 years at ESPN. I got to do Sports Center, which very few people can say they got to do that. So I'm incredibly proud of being the first person and really, to be honest, kind of the only person that's ever been the voice of Monday Night Raw and also has done Sports Center. It's never been done, but it's laid the road now for like Todd Grisham. He did wrestling and ESPN. Charlie Caruso, she does currently wrestling and ESPN. So. I feel like we kind of opened the door uh, and all the battles that I had to have personally led to uh, other people now being able to do both. Uh, Pat McAfee is another example. Uh, but before me, that never happened because uh, short-sighted executives wouldn't allow it to happen. Luckily, a lot of those executives are gone now and, and it, it's opened the door for, for a lot of people to do a lot of things in both. Well, so in WWE, you came in immediately. You had these amazing matches with Trish and Jazz and all, all these amazing superstars you talked about. You, you won your first two world titles, I think, within the first few years of being in WWE. But you were a staple. Like, you joined in maybe 2002 when I was two years old, but I was still watching you wrestle in WWE up until maybe 2009, 2010, and then only did you go to TNA. So I wanted to ask, what was it like being essentially one of the most experienced by the time we got to that later era of 2009 or so before you went to TNA? I still was still self-doubting, <laughs> honestly. I, it never goes away. Even the indies, like, like you know, I retired recently. Even in the indie, independent shows, I want to vomit and just go, like, you know, because the independents, you really don't know the girl. Like, the girls, like, we worked in WWE and TNA, you kind of learn what their repertoire is and you know their right. style, right? And so you're used to working that, oh, she's going to do this, or, you know what I mean, just by body language. And so you can read each other. When you don't go to independence, you don't know this person. You're like, I don't know what she does. What move does she do? What is that? I should know that move. I don't know what that is. But going to TNA, you know, I always, I always, I felt when I first went there, I had a target on my back because they're, I know they were going, oh, this WWE diva is coming to our show. Well, thank you for your, 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 you know, you're gracing our stage, that kind right. of thing. And um, so I, I kind of felt like, God, I have a lot to prove. You know what I mean? But the reason why I went there, when I watched Gail and, and Awesome Kong and ODB, all these girls having amazing matches, I was like, wow, these are girls I've never faced. And that's what intrigued me. And the girls had a lot more freedom to do their match. Like, you didn't have to ask a lot of permission there. Right. And I came from going, hey, can I do this? Is it okay I do this? Not, not every move, but you're like, I'm going to start it like this. And you're like, nope the match before you started like that you need to change it up so every match has to be a little bit different you know right and um so you have you were responsible in wwe to watch the matches before you oh shoot they just did our our cutoff spot oh no oh they just did our finish you know <laughs> what i mean so you're like oh no we gotta hurry up and change it and um but tna uh, very open arms they're they're all welcoming and was just very loving um very very mellow atmosphere compared to WWE. It was very mellow. Um, now, in that first interview, The Rock immediately asks what your name is, and you say famously, they call me the coach, and The Rock goes on that whole tirade, as you just said. Was that always the plan for you to come in there with a character as the coach? Or was that just a nickname that orga organically grew into the character you became? Well, I've been the coach since I was three years old. I mean, it's been my nickname forever. I've never had a first name other than my mother and my, and my brothers and sisters. Certainly my sister don't call me the coach, but um, that's always been my nickname, always. And to be able to use it professionally, I didn't, certainly when you're in local news, they don't like anything that's outside of the box, which I think that's changed now. So for somebody like you, that's just coming into the business, uh, you don't have to be so buttoned up. Uh, you don't have to be as conservative as we did 20 years ago. Uh, but I pushed, because I was in Wichita for a very, very, very short period of time, and then Kansas City. 
when I got to Wichita, I got my first job. I told our main anchor, I said, when you toss to me, I want you to say, all right, let's go out to the stadium and the coach is there. I said, if we just do that a couple of times, people are going to get used to it. And that's what I tell kids all the time when it comes to branding, when it comes to your brand or whatever brand you're talking about. If you just train people to get used to hearing something or seeing something, they will get used to it. It's why I've, I've never understood when executives won't try something because if it works, then you've trained the audience. If it doesn't work, they, they move so fast that they'll move on and they'll forget the idea that didn't work. But if you just don't try something, then you're never gonna know. So for me to try to use my nickname when I first got into local TV, was it a risk? Not for me it wasn't, because I knew I wanted to stick out. And saying Jonathan, that's a boring name. It's a three syllable name. It's hard to set on the air over and over and over and over. But the coach, the coach just rolls right off the top. Mm -hmm. So for me, I've, I've worked my entire career to be called the coach on the air. And there have been times, whether it's locally, ESPN, whatever the case might be, that some executives that just don't like entertainment, they didn't want me to use it. And actually one time at ESPN, they sent a memo out that said no more nicknames and put some, some just BS names at the top, like can't call Chris Fowler CF anymore. I mean, nobody calls Chris Fowler CF, nobody. Uh, but they just didn't want to look like they were singling me out. Uh, but I tell people all the time, if you really believe in something and you really want to brand something and it matters to you, then fight for it. Don't die on the ledge over it, but fight for it. And I have, and it didn't always work out in my favor, but sitting here today, I'm the coach from wrestling, but also now from the world of golf, and we worked really hard to get there. What was it from there that got you into actually doing YouTube? Because, you know, there's a lot of wrestling content in general out there, so it must have been, you know, a little daunting to try and get into it and just carve out your own niche, which you've clearly done at this point. But what was it in those early days? What made you decide to take that plunge? Well, I was kind of an early adopter of YouTube in college because it was breaking out just around the time I was doing my focus on like journalism and electronic media. So I worked a lot in video editing and that's where you put your reel up, you know, it was YouTube. It was very, it's still, you know, all my, all my old demo reels are still up there hidden in my personal account somewhere. But uh, yeah, I got into YouTube for a while and I always fantasized about having like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if I had some kind of funny wrestling channel, like a sketch channel or something because I was really inspired by this YouTube channel that one of my favorite bands at the time had and they were doing kind of a sketch comedy thing like that'd be funny to apply wrestling to that but I never really had I had this idea just rattling around and then also at the same time when I was graduating college and like first couple years out I was really a big fan of like the nostalgia critic and the angry video game nerd who are like the like they're they really kind of they they developed a cottage industry or they're responsible for a cottage industry of like a bunch of like nerdy wrestling YouTube critics. That's like basically, it's a whole industry <laughs> of itself and they're kind of responsible for it, um, for better or for worse. So like I had then like a few years down the line, I was a fan of like all these different, you know, offshoots of that uh, that archetype. I'm like, why everyone's covering like comic books and music and movies. Why is nobody covering professional wrestling? Because I feel that's a, a medium that's ripe for that kind of analysis and, and skewering. And now uh, everybody's doing it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I mean, it was happening back in, you know, when I was in college, I would go to wrestlecrap.com uh, or, um, you know, the people's wrestling website.net, you know, all these different places where there was that kind of thing existing in text form. But no one was really doing it for your video at the time. Like in 2013, wrestling YouTube is not as big and vast as, as, as it is now, um, especially when I was getting into it and the, the content that I was trying to put out because no one else was doing like long form video essays with a humorous you know, tint to it. Basically nobody was doing Nostalgia Critic for wrestling. And that right. was what I wanted to do. That was my number one goal was I want to try this. And it just started out as kind of a hobby or something I didn't, you know, I put the energy and the thought into it and I did what I could to make it look good on a very limited budget. Um, but I did have at least the knowledge of how to edit video and how to write. So I had that down. Um, so that's kind of like what got me into it was again, kind of like the need was there, I felt, or like it was available to be tapped into. And uh, now, of course, like, yeah, wrestling YouTube is so huge and like so many people have channels now. And of course the wrestling podcast scene is, is just 
there's not enough grains of sand in the Sahara to represent the number <laughs> of wrestling podcasts out there. I'll just say that. Yeah, uh, I mean, hell, we're, we're, we're dipping our toes in the water now. So we're adding to this curse or blessing, whatever you call it. Yeah, well, good luck. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's just like, I think at the time, wrestling YouTube was not fully explored. And I was just really happy to kind of provide that. Um, not provide anything, but at least I, it, it, I had the motivation and I had the inspiration to, to get into it because I felt really passionate about that idea and like no one else is doing it. So at what point did you realize you could do this full time? Because obviously I'm sure for people who don't know, your first video, at least I'm pretty sure with that uh, analysis you did of Muhammad Hassan. So obviously you didn't upload that and immediately think you're going to be a millionaire. But at what point did you realize you could do this full time as a job as you said you did? Uh, when I started getting paid for the videos, which took a long time. It took about two years. Is that really a Canadian accent really that bad? Because we've seen in wrestling, I mean, you know, Jim Ross is the voice of wrestling, and he's got that deep Southern accent. There's also Taz with that thick Brooklyn accent. Is a Canadian accent really the worst thing to have? The interesting thing, it's such a good question, because in America, all those accents are very much accepted. Like, you know, the, the Boston's accent is a little bit, you know, that, that's it's quite you know it's quite distinct yeah and the, the new york accent's very distinct as well and you know, there's all kinds of accents the southern accent there's something about when an american hears a canadian accent and their ears perk on. up they're like oh you're not you're not from here you're no what did you just say did you say you were sorry <laughs> you were sorry <laughs> you know so i think it's just like we're used to hearing Stone Cold and Jim Ross's Southern accent, but when someone out of, you know, when you haven't heard, sorry, I'll get to that tomorrow. I'm so sorry for all my Canadian friends who are listening to this right now. <laughs> you don't have an accent. No, no Canadian thinks they have an accent. So we'll just, we'll just keep thinking that. Gotcha, yeah, that's very interesting to hear because, you know, I guess it's just that American mentality of, well, all these people, they may, they may sound funny to me, but they're from here. But you, you know, yeah. you're from right over the border, so you got to change that. There's also this, you know, there's this like American mentality of like, like America, like we, we do things here a certain way. Oh, you're from somewhere else. And like, you know, a lot of Americans have never even been to Canada before, which I completely invite you to go to Canada. Canada is a great place to visit. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, growing up in Canada, what was the first WrestleMania you went to? Was it uh, Mania 6? That was in uh, Toronto, or was it X8? Uh, which one was it? So I am as old as WrestleMania. So uh, <laughs> I, I I can't imagine going to WrestleMania six, although that would have been really cool. That, that's great. Mm -hmm. You are a Los Angeles guy. You've been here at Fox for however many years. Went to USC before that. What does it mean to you for WrestleMania to be coming back to this city? Well, ironically, I got to go to uh, WrestleMania two at the LA Sports Arena. So when I when I was growing up, the Sports Arena were were where I would go see usually house shows. Right? There wasn't mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of TV tapings. It was there wasn't Raw or SmackDown. So it was it was house shows around you know uh, um, shows like uh, WWE superstars, and then every once in a while you get a, a Friday, uh, Saturday night's main event. But um, WrestleMania was in three places. Um, yeah. At the Coliseum, at the Rosemont Horizon, and the LA Sports Arena. And the LA Sports Arena, the main event was uh, Hulk Hogan versus King Kong Bundy in the, in the big blue cage. And so I was fortunate enough to be there. Awesome. Uh, and so um, I, uh, I'm looking forward to another WrestleMania in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, a, a large stretch of years in between them. Speaking of WrestleMania, what's been your favorite WrestleMania moment? Because you had the chance not only to be a backstage interviewer, but you were, I believe, at some point a general manager going into WrestleMania. You've been a broadcaster at WrestleMania. Yeah. What's your favorite WrestleMania moment, you know, not as a fan, in the business? When, when you are in it and you're constantly going 52 weeks a year, you don't have a chance to stop and look back and say, man, I did all that. And I, I recently just did that because people will send me clips all the time and I'd forgotten that I had been those different roles at, at WrestleMania. So uh, that's pretty awesome. I've been to, I think there's been 36, I've been to 20 of the 36 WrestleManias, which is pretty cool. Uh, but for me, it's it's easy. Uh, it's that it's that interview with, with Rock. Uh, nobody ever thought that the face of the first generation, which was the 80s, would ever face uh, one of the faces of the 2000s, The Rock or Stone Cold or Undertaker or whatever it was. And to have The Rock and those just two mega powers and to be able to see it up close and to see how they put it together, to see how it changed when they got to the ring uh, because the crowd uh, was not cheering the way they thought the crowd was going to cheer. To have The Rock have the brilliance 
to be able to change the match that they've been working on for a week or two weeks was brilliant and showed uh, his talent at the highest level in front of the most people, 80,000 people, millions more watching on pay-per-view at home. And to have that four minutes before that match with just me and The Rock and saying our prayers and eating our vitamins and, and all that kind of stuff, that was really, really cool. And that's something that nobody can take away from me. That's something that lives, it will live forever. And I'm, I'm grateful to have, have those moments and to be able to be a part of WrestleMania history in a small way. Yeah, I mean, that's a great answer right there. Other things that come to mind is your other interview with The Rock the next year when he was going to face Stone Cold, because your interviews with him were usually so comedic. And that one, he went completely deadly serious to really highlight the, 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 the gravity of the situation. So. Going on from that, I wanted to ask you, what was, what was the transition like going from backstage interviewer to announcer to, you know, fully fledged on-air personality, a character, a wrestler in yeah. the ring? Uh, was it was the hardest, like? hardest thing I've ever done. People don't understand how hard it is to, to train to physically be a professional wrestler. Uh, I say this all the time, I think Kurt Angle is the greatest in-ring performer ever because of his background and what he was able to do. You're completely changing what your mind tells you to do. Taking a body slam or a suplex or a clothesline, whatever it is, uh, that's not normal. And your body and how it reacts is not normal. So I was training in the ring while I was traveling on the road and I was already in the shows and I was already working back in the studio doing six to seven studio shows a week. We were working our asses off. And I'll never forget, I was in the gym and Vince McMahon walked up to me as he was working out with his trainer. And he said, hey, we're, we have an idea. You're 6'3", you know, you walk around at 240 pounds. Would you want to become a character? And if you do, you've got to physically train so that you can take the bumps because you're going to have to get in the ring. And at some point, you're going to have to learn how to get beat up because I was so good at making people hate me that if you don't give them a payoff and allow them to see you get beat up, so they can cheer, then you're not doing the business a, the service that, and, and respecting it the way that it needs to be respected. So uh, I was in there four or five days a week, training in the afternoon, empty arenas. Uh, it wasn't fun, it wasn't glamorous, but being on the show and with the bright lights and on Monday nights and, and Thursday nights, that was awesome. So it was really, really, really hard though. And I'll never forget that. Just before this, you mentioned that Beth Phoenix came into that match having just torn an ACL, which speaks to how physical and how dangerous the sport is. And I wanted to ask you about uh, one of your injuries. Um, I believe that in, you, at one point when you went to Japan to wrestle very early in your career, you worked a whole tour on a torn ACL. Could you please tell us about that? Yeah, I did. I, I worked, um, I blew my leg out um, in, a in like a practice and then I finished the tour with a torn ACL and it, I mean, I, I didn't have a lot of stability and my leg was pretty swollen, but in my mind, I, I wasn't like, I, I actually wasn't believing that I was even hurt. I was sort of just kind of in denial, but I also didn't want to just go home and not finish the tour, you know? And, and nowadays I look back on that and I'm like, God, that was crazy because I couldn't run without my leg popping out of its socket. And like, probably I probably did more damage to my leg continuing, but I also like, I'm, not, I'm the type of person that when I want to succeed at something, I will do it through a broken leg, broken ankle. You know, I've, I've worked through pretty much every sort of situation that you can work through. I mean, my dad passed away and I was back at work like days later because I have passion for what I do. I love what I love what I do. I love being in the ring. I love being around my friends. I love, I love what I do. So I'm lucky that I have something that drives me passionately that I can push through injuries and personal you know, hardships to be able to like fight to go and do do that stuff. And you know, we're we're still we're still fighting. So all, all the women in WWE are still fighting to continue this women's evolution that we have. You know, that we started. You know, WWE kind of spearheaded for us in 2015. The girls, it, we're still fighting. Every every one of us is still fighting for a chance to show what we can do. So we our our journey still continues with that. <laughs> interesting conversations that I find fascinating. But I like straddling this line. I like that I haven't gone all in on the wrestling interviews. Like this week I had 
Mike O'Hearn, one of the Great greatest bodybuilders of all time on my show. You know, a few weeks ago, I had UFC legend Vitor Balfour on. Also a really good interview. Oh, well, thank you. And I want to continue to have these conversations with people who I think that we can learn from. And I, I, I don't know, I, I can't see why anyone in the wrestling media would have an issue with me having these conversations. And I, 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 I oh, no, me neither. I was, I was curious. No, I put the, I put them out there, and you know, if, if someone that has a website wants to take quotes from it, by all means, you know, do it. And uh, actually, on that Vitor, uh, Vitor Belfort interview, or just you know, people who aren't in wrestling in general, has there anyone, sure. has there been anyone you've interviewed that has been you know a surprise wrestling fan or a, a closet or just someone you didn't know was a wrestling fan that interested? So I, every time I have the opportunity to get a wrestling question in with a celebrity, I will do it. Even if it never makes it to air, I'll just like do it for my own personal. Like, So Mickey Rourke was one. I interviewed Mickey Rourke a few months after he got snubbed. I thought he should have won the Oscar for, for the, wrestler. the wrestler. And I, I told him this. And then he actually went into like how Triple H had helped him prepare for the role. And I'm like, Wow. That was really cool. Hugh Jackman, I actually did my very first interview with Hugh Jackman backstage at a Monday Night Raw. So like, oh, awesome! if I ever have the opportunity to tie wrestling into it, it's kind of like that moment in Step Brothers where it's like, did we just become best friends? <laughs> yep. And you know, wrestling's a very special thing. When you like wrestling, you like You're it. You're in. Yeah, you like wrestling. It's, you know, it's like any of those things, any of those really niche things. So if I can find someone else that likes wrestling, I like to connect with them on that level. My very first interview with Billy Corgan, like six years ago, I remember starting it on a Monday night. We were on a red carpet and I go, Billy, you know, I, you and I are both missing Raw right now. And he's like, I know, we're missing Raw. And I'm like, oh, right, we're in, this is great. Yeah, but now so many people know you as that just because of, you know, five time TNA Knockouts champion and then knock, Knockouts division being so, you know, renowned, especially considering how far women's wrestling has come. And, you know, you look back and that was really the start of a lot of people's careers. And even yeah. now it's still going. And then Gail, Gail Kim is um, one of the, um, in, in, like one of the head bosses there. Mm -hmm. it, it's the first time a female has been in her position. Right. So, um, yeah, so, you know, of course she's pro women division. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's blown up. It's crazy. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, I have a couple specific questions about your career I want to ask, but before that, I just wanted to quickly talk to you about, you know, you started off as one of the Godfather's hoes on the side, and then you ended, you know, after having this legendary career. And, you know, since then, seeing how far women's wrestling has come, what does that mean to you, especially knowing you're such a big part of that? It's amazing. Honestly, you're a proud, proud, you're proud of these kids, you know? Like, you're like, you know, um, it, it, it's like, you're never bitter or jealous, like, you know, the exposure they're getting now, but you're just like, mm -hmm. oh, man, it's about the time, kind of, sort of, you know? Right. So, kind of, sort of, it's about time. They should have been made eventually a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, as girls, we work really hard. We don't want to be just looked at as being just sexy. You know, we're athletes out there. We're bad actors that do our own stunts. You know, we, we want that other respect aspect of it. And, um, but when, when you all this you're just you're so proud oh my gosh you're just like oh, this is amazing it's amazing you know just mm -hmm. excelled so quickly too to me not i mean after me being out i want to talk about a little bit more about your relationship with the fans what was it like being the first women's match ever in saudi arabia because that's something being from the middle east that um it's not something that i really ever thought would happen at least so quickly and then here we have it you and lacey evans have that match what was it like being part of that be a part of that match was, I mean, it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest moment for women in wrestling, for women in pro wrestling. And I say that, like, even compared to the first women's main, like, the women main eventing WrestleMania, the, the match in Saudi Arabia wasn't, it wasn't about WWE. It wasn't about me. It wasn't about Lacey. It was just about, like, women opening up a door in Saudi Arabia that had never been opened before. We were doing something that no performers have ever done in that country. No female performers have ever gone there and performed. And and for us to be the first performers, not just women wrestlers, women competitors, but actual females to perform, it was a, I felt like it was a world changing moment. And to be a part of that, it was something that like, you know, it'll never, 
it, it's a moment that'll never be taken away from me or Lacey or from those WWE archives as being incredibly special because we didn't know how the fans would receive us. We didn't know how that country would receive us. And we were, we were received so well. And it's just, again, very indicative of where that country is, you know, that they, they, they believe in, in, in women competing in WWE. They want to see more of it. So I'm hoping next time we go to Saudi Arabia that we can, you know, I can be a part of the first ever women's tag team match or the first ever women's, you know, ladder match in Saudi Arabia or the first ever women's main event match in Saudi Arabia. You never know. But to be able to open that door with Lacey and to be able, again, open a door that's never been opened before, it's, it was just, I think, world changing. Exactly, 100%. And that's the, you know, the mantra for wrestling fans everywhere. If there is wrestling, we will find it. So I just wanted to get your prediction. Who's going to be in the main event of WrestleMania 37? I know we're so many ways out, but just th throw some names out there. What do you want to see? 37 main event. Uh, I am going to go with, it feels like Roman Reigns, right? He's, he's had his fair mm -hmm. share of uh, WrestleMania main events. Um, and, and he is a, a quote unquote bad guy now. So we need to, we need to have a, a, a suitable uh, good guy. Do you do, uh, maybe it's title versus title with him and Drew McIntyre could be a pretty big match. Um, you know, at, at some point, obviously, uh, you know, now that Daniel Bryan has had his second child, he, he pops into the picture. Um, but I, yeah, I think it, I think it will be some, somehow Roman Reigns will be in that main event. What is your prediction for what the main event of WrestleMania 37 will be? Well, I'd love to see some women involved in the main event of WrestleMania. I mean, you, you know, the girls are always chomping at the bit and um, I would I would absolutely love to see a girls main event again. And you never know. I mean, like the girls right now, we're already building some really great stories. You know, again, it's, it's all everything, everything that we're doing right now in WWE, it's all, I always feel like it's all the road to WrestleMania. Like everything, everything's building to that. Like I think about the women's first ever main event at WrestleMania and it started at SummerSlam mm -hmm. where Becky Lynch turned on Charlotte Flair and that's really where like, you know, you, you start seeing the waves of these stories come through. So you never know. I mean, I know Becky Lynch is expecting a baby right now so we won't see her for a little bit, but like that was, it happened at SummerSlam where Becky, got that momentum from turning on Charlotte. And then mm -hmm. she and Charlotte had their rivalry. Becky gained, again, more momentum and then went into that match with uh, Ronda and Charlotte. So it all it all kind of started months and months prior. So there's lots brewing. Um, you never know. I mean, maybe ev everybody's talking about The Rock versus Roman Reigns. Maybe that will happen. You know, that would be really, really cool to see that happen at WrestleMania. The last thing I want to ask you is, well, First of all, what are you looking forward to most about your, I guess, your new life here in Los Angeles? And then what are you looking forward to most about WrestleMania 37? I just love being in Los Angeles, although I need to cut back on In-N-Out. I've been going In-N-Out way too much. It's too good. Um, I'm just looking forward to the opportunities here. I, I, I've, I've loved every other place I've lived in. I've moved a lot in my career. But I love that stuff happens here. You know, stuff happens in Los Angeles. So that's Agreed. what I'm most excited for. Um, I'm WrestleMania 37, I think I'm just excited to like, I, I'm i moving forward like WrestleMania 37 is gonna be back to normal. Like Me we're, too. We're gonna be at full capacity, we're not wearing masks, and I know I might be eating these words next March, but I'm, it's Are April, you or I guess April. Like, um, yes, it's August right now. I am so hopeful that we can have like a, a huge event, everything is fine, and we can put the current situation that we're in right now behind us and learn and grow from it and just get better. Yeah, I mean, you, you said it better than I could have ever said it. So we, got, we just got to learn and get better, both you know, outside of wrestling, inside of wrestling, in journalism. I'm gonna take everything you told me about what uh, you learned from Oprah and how to hopefully approach Jericho and you know, go forward into that in WrestleMania 37. Chris you got Van this, man. Uh, you yeah, thanks this. so much. Thanks so much for joining us. And you know, that was, this was hopefully not your last time on UCLA Radio. I'm gonna put that out there. Let's do it. It's definitely not my last time. I'm gonna put that out there. Awesome.